Well, I felt very comfortable during that, Daniel. I was just making up my own words. So, hey, thanks to our praise team for leading, in us, leading us in a time of reflection. Well, the notes should be coming to you, and they are entitled, The Coming of the Holy Spirit is a Big Deal. I mean, it's a big deal. We mentioned last week that he is our new best friend. This has been the great plan of God. We see it coming into fulfillment where Jesus said, I've told you that there's a comforter coming. And he's coming and he'll be with you always. In fact, he will be in you. What an incredible understanding that we have the very presence of God in us. <clears throat> and here we find not only has there been this great display, <clears throat> <clears throat> this great display of the Holy Spirit's coming with the, the fiery tongues over the tops of people. Not only have we seen that, not only have we seen the crowd, and, and the crowd is amazed. They heard this rushing roar of a wind. They're there at the temple. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, the noise, the excitement. 3,000 men are there. The women and children are there. Uh, people from all over the world who happen to be there, they're a part of this to witness this. And then there was the great confusion. Because some who would not believe a bunch of religious zealots anyway, they just marked it off, not listening to hear that it was a language that they knew that was being spoken by somebody in that crowd of 120, by at least the, the apostles, but perhaps by all 120 in that upper room. Rather than to believe that, they were just saying, oh, don't even listen, they're all drunk, they're just making a bunch of noise, nobody can understand what's going on. And that's where we pick up our story, and we do that with the explanation, and we'll start with the clarification. The clarification, now this is a big deal. Now think about it, this is in a day when there's no printing press, so there's not going to be a bunch of booklets given out to people. Here's what we want you to know with this new relationship with God in the eyes of the people there with this new religion. Here's what we offer you. We offer you when you come to Christ by repentance and faith, that you're going to be given the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit of God will introduce you in an intimate way with who Jesus is and what his importance is to your life. So we want to preach this gospel message. Peter's going to do that. And then we want you to go back home. And isn't it amazing that the entire world changed on that day? These people then scatter to all of these different areas around the world. And then in the book of Acts, for the next nearly 40 years, we watch Peter and Paul primarily and their helpers, and they begin to go, and they go farther, and they go farther, and they do more, and they teach more. And oftentimes, as you read through the New Testament, what's happening during this period is they go to a new place. And when they go there, there are those people who know what they're talking about, either because maybe they were in Jerusalem, or maybe because they knew somebody who had been there. And then much of what we find in the epistles are the, the writers saying, oh, we ran into this problem when we talked to these people. This is a problem, a misunderstanding that's happened in this location. And then that's where the letters were written. But think about it. This is God's plan. If you have come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God now lives with you and he will guide you into all truth. What an incredible start of a, no doubt, the most important movement the world has ever seen, the movement of the church. 
So let's take a look at what's happened thus far in our story, and then we'll try to make some good biblical applications. The clarification, chapters, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 through 31. First, we meet the speaker. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. And then he makes a very simple statement. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. And then he begins to preach the scriptures. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great glorious day of the Lord, um, the great glorious day the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In his introduction, he calls out and he says, this is the heart of what I'm saying. This is not a new thought. This is not a new idea. This was prophesied long ago. And this is what you need to remember. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you see that phrase there about the moon and then the sun, sun being darkened? If you're on the internet, you can read a lot of things. People are anticipating all kinds of things tomorrow. Tomorrow is just another event in the solar history of our world. There's no real religious significance to that. But this is talking about a period from the time Jesus ascended until the day of the Lord is completed. When God comes and, and finishes all the things on his to-do list, when Jesus comes back, during this period of time, Peter is saying, everything that the Bible has predicted is true and it will take place. And you are witnesses of the first and the most important part, the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. Next is the condemnation. That would be a nice positive message, but... Peter does not hold back. He says, here's something we've got to talk about. We are right here today. I am here to tell you that Jesus is alive and that you are guilty because you were responsible. You were in the crowd that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Now, mind you, this is just 50 days after the crucifixion. There's been a, a lot of, of, of rumors all over this city. I mean, Jesus was crucified, was buried, was, was guarded by Roman guards, by, you know, with the fear of their lives being taken if they failed in their duty. And now the story is everywhere. An angel came, an angel rolled away the stone. Jesus is alive. Have you seen him? No, but my aunt did. No, but my cousin did. There are 500 witnesses. This is a great proof of the resurrection of Christ because had these people wanted to stop this movement right now, all they would have had to do was go to the grave and bring out that rotting corpse. All they would have had to done was bring those guards before the people and say, no, he was in the grave and he's still there. If you want to see where we've moved him, we've moved him to this location. It's all there. You can't, you can't say this. It's not true. But nobody could do that. I mean, the witnesses are just growing in number. No, I've seen him. My aunt, my uncle, my brother, my father, my mother, they touched him. So now it's a big deal. So Peter begins the next part of his sermon. People of Israel, listen. 
God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of the lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. He's not going to take an offering after this sermon because none of these people are going to give it. No, he says, don't blame the Jew or the Romans. You Jews were a part of this. You're the ones that acted in partnership with this hated Roman government and you crucified him. Messiah was crucified by his foes, but now look, Peter says, but the Messiah was resurrected by his father. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me, I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Again, going back to the book of Psalms. And then he makes a twofold conclusion. The first one concerning the resurrection. We have this part of the sermon recorded for us in verse 29. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself when, for he died and was buried and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet. And he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. I mean, these disciples have had this transformational understanding. They tell me, I never experienced it, but they tell me that for some students, they'll be doing algebra, ooh. They'll be doing algebra and they'll be working and working and they don't get it. And then all of a sudden, one day, ah, I understand what we're doing now. And then they'll jump into it, and then perhaps algebra comes their favorite subject. Now, I know that did not happen my first year of Algebra 1. And it did not happen my second year of Algebra 1. But I've heard other people say that. That's what happened here. These people who had walked with Jesus, who never could understand it, who could not see the connection from the Old Testament to the life and ministry of Jesus, and why was there the death of our Savior, and, and why is there a resurrection, and then he leaves before he does anything, they didn't get it. Now they're beginning to understand it. They're saying, oh, all of this is a part of a great plan. We never saw it before. We never understood it. Now we're beginning to see the big picture. This has always been God's plan. That Jesus would die. That he would be buried and raised on the third day. And let, let her be under our notes. Concerning Jesus' exaltation. Verse 33, now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. 
So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Now we don't know how much longer this sermon is because we're told later on that he preached for a long time. But these are the notes the Holy Spirit of God has written for us. And it's obvious that the main message is this. This Jesus you crucified, he is alive and that changes everything. Nothing is the same because he is alive. And not only that, Peter says, but he has been exalted. He is sitting at the place of highest honor at the Father's right hand. And not only that, he has poured out his Holy Spirit on us. Now we have the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is a big deal in the book of Acts. This is a big deal in the church age. This is why we are here today. Not because the religion was formalized so early and all of the rules were written down. It's not that. It's not a religion. It's not a ritual. We have continued we, the Christian people who have placed faith in Christ, we have continued to prosper and to do the work of the Great Commission because now we know God. Did you notice in our songs that we sang earlier that there are those, those inferences there where we know him because he speaks to us. Though we've never seen Jesus, we love him. He's more than just a friend. Though we cannot produce the proof, we know it. There's a witness inside of us that convinces us clear until the day of our death, it is all right because I know Jesus. What an incredible testimony. What an incredible witness God has given to us. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And then we see the conviction. That is the neat thing to watch, isn't it? We've seen that happen on many occasions. We're so thankful for it that someone comes because they're curious. And they come and they listen and they're not sure they really believe anything that we're, we are preaching from the word of God. And then slowly but surely, not the work of us as individuals, not the work of the church collectively, but it is the work of God's Holy Spirit and then he brings into that person's understanding, whoa, if God is real, if he knows everything about me, if I too will die like everybody in the world has, what am I going to do when I face God? And then the conviction of the Holy Spirit begins to say to our soul, you need to get ready. You need to, you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to know somebody who can fix your problem. You don't know how many times we have texted or called Scott and said, Scott, this isn't working. And whatever, I mean, I know the rest of the family has to do the work while he's gone, but Scott comes and he fixes it. I mean, that's a big deal around here to have somebody. You saved the wedding, didn't you, by fixing the ice cream machine. You are looking at a hero because we would not have had a good time without the ice cream machine. But I mean, this is somebody who fixes everything in our soul, not just doing maintenance and, and diagnostic work with problems in a building. I mean, this is somebody who prepares us for eternity, who prepares us for judgment, we know Jesus. But the conviction came and said, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? 
Now, Peter has already mentioned, you, like everybody, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talked about you need to repent because you put him on the cross. You need to know that this has always been God's plan, that everyone should call on the name of the Lord. But we do get to a section here where there is some controversy. What I do not want to do is to do what we are most comfortable with is this. I'm a Baptist. I don't have to think. Baptists don't think. We just believe what we're told. And this is what I've always believed. That's a dangerous way to approach the scriptures, right? I'm a Methodist. I'm a charismatic. Whatever it is, it's a dangerous way to approach the scriptures. What we need to do is to very carefully understand that this was a book. We call it that. It's a series of books. It's several books, 27 in the New Testament, and that God wrote it over a period of time from the beginning of the Gospels until the writing of the book of Revelation by the Apostle John. I mean, we're only looking at maybe 50 years. So over a period of time, God kept sending us one more letter, one more letter to explain this incredible faith that we now possess. Making sure that we had more understanding, more clarification. Some people, when they study church history, it discourages them because they see that the church is wrestling with important questions. There's nothing wrong with wrestling with important questions. But of all people, we are the most blessed because now we have the entire scriptures given to us. So anytime we see a subject and we're not sure exactly what it means, what we need to do is gather all of the information about that particular subject, that particular concept, that doctrine. We need to gather all of the chapters and all of the verses. And then we need to do the hard work of putting them in, 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 uh, in categories and separating them and combining them and comparing them so that we can say, oh, I get it. There is harmony in the scriptures. There's not this verse is true and this verse is true and these verses are against each other. That can't be. If it is, we really have a problem. We do not have the word of God. So here is the verse and you'll recognize it. Peter replied, to these people at this time, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, your this is promises to you, to your children, and to those far away, for all who have been called by the Lord our God. Here's what I'd like to do today. That verse could involve uh, a series of Sundays. The, our intention is not to deal with every difficult passage and come to a conclusion and then vote on it and everybody agree. I mean, that might be hard to do. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do is to take this important message, these commands given by Peter to this crowd and understand it in the context of this day. Now that is so important and I, again, I don't intend that every answer will be, will be satisfactory. I'm going to encourage you to go to places like gotquestions.org type in your questions. What does this mean? If you do that with this particular verse, it'll talk to you about the, the verb that is used, the conjunction for the free, uh, remission of sins. It'll talk to you about the change of the, the first person singular to the plural. I mean, it'll talk about all those things. Here's what I want you to see today before we look at our um, applications. In about AD 30, that's when this took place. If we flip a few pages, we would be in AD 37, more or less. And here is Peter doing the next big sermon. 
So now for about seven years, the, the, the message of Jesus is spreading throughout the Jewish community. It has been primarily a Jewish church. If not Jewish completely, at least those other people who are not Jewish are people who have become Jews. The God fears, the Bible refers to them as. So now it's been a Jewish church that's growing. In their church, it was obvious, or in that understanding, you identified with your leader by way of baptism. So, I mean, it's a big deal. If you're a born again, if you're a follower of Christ, then it's given up through these verses. Well, of course you would be baptized. Of course you would. Why not? That's what every Christian does. It's a big deal to be baptized in this Jewish community. Because in so doing, like it is today in some Orthodox circles, when you took that big step, you are no longer considered Jewish. You are now a follower of the Messiah, the Gentiles Messiah. So that's AD 30. Let's flip the calendar to maybe AD 37. And now this is the next great introduction of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. And Cornelius is the individual. Just listen as I read part of the story. You'll remember this is the one where Peter is sitting there and he has this vision of the sheep coming down and the Lord says, get up and eat. And Peter says, Lord, I can't eat. These are unclean animals. And the Lord says, what I tell you is clean, it's clean. Now get up and eat. So that's the, the heart of what's happening. But here's how it started. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as everyone in, as was everyone in his household. And now the big sheet experience. Then they said to Peter, those who were sent by Cornelius, they said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that you can, so that he can hear your message. So Peter goes and he stays in the home of a Gentile. That's a big deal. That made him ceremonially unclean. But he goes to the house and there he begins to preach and he begins to explain who Jesus is and why Jesus came. And, and Cornelius says, oh, I get it. I finally understand it. That's what I've been aching for and longing for. And a bit later in the story, we see this in verse 36 of chapter 10. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord over all. And then he goes on, and he preaches a little while. And it says in verse 39, And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen whom God had ch chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We are those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one he is the one all of the prophets testify saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. So now this is the next big sermon that's preached. And now Paul says, or Peter says, this is the message. You must repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus and then you'll be forgiven. As Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? 
So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. So there you have the event from A.D. 30 to A.D. 37, the two most important sermons. And then if you would go to Acts chapter 20, verse 20 and 21, two of my favorite verses. This is towards the end of the church age. This is about 57 AD. And Paul now summarizes the gospel message that he preached. And he said this, this is the message of the good news that I've preached. Oh, I didn't print it out here. Let me read it for you real quick. Acts 20. And it reads like this. Verse 20 and 21. Smaller print. I got to get the right, uh, the right distance here. And he says, uh, he talks about all the trials he's been through in verse 20. And I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you everything that was profitable from teaching you in public and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel message is clearly summarized in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by God's incredible grace that we, through faith in Christ, have been redeemed. Now, there's more we can say, and we will as we go through our story. But let's go now to the next part of the story with the challenge. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all of his listeners... Save yourself from this crooked generation. And then the conversions. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. What a great story. Now I got all the way and didn't get to the applications. Let's go through it really very quickly because it's so important. These days that we're talking about in the book of Acts are unusual days. Let's say very clearly that God is not obligated to repeat all of his actions. The book of Acts is a historical document about the church of that day. It is not a book on what we have to do today. So you'll understand a lot of what I'm talking about if you've been around those who are maybe of a charismatic persuasion. Don't be pressured to imitate the unusual. If God wants us to do something, he will tell us very clearly as we read through the epistles. This is how you're to respond and this is what you're to do. All the true believers receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not only for those who are super Christians. No, every Christian at the point of conversion receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is true that all true believers should be baptized. Jesus told us in his great commission very clearly, if you know me, show the world by being immersed in water, by being baptized. And then one final word. Sometimes we say, I wish I could hear the voice of God like the apostles did. That he would speak to me like this, face to face. And I'm reminded of the verse, you know it in uh, the story in 1 Kings 19, where Elijah is discouraged and a, a rushing wind comes by, a big storm comes by, and he wants to hear the voice of God. And then we're told, but the Lord was in the sound and it was of a gentle whisper. There is a witness that God has with us through his Holy Spirit. We can know what God wants us to do because there is a small, still voice that we respond to. Quickly, one more last thing here. In Isaiah, it's a chapter filled with a lot of judgment. But in that, it says, right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Every couple of years, we'll have an activity with our young people where there'll be a landmine set up in the middle of the floor. And all the people in the crowd will shout, go to the left, go to the left, watch out, watch out. And the person playing the game is trained to hear one voice that says, take two tiny steps forward. 
take one step sideways and they are trained to hear the voice of that one partner to navigate as they're blindfolded through that landmine on the floor. We have with us the Holy Spirit of God and with his witness there is a still small voice that we can hear and he will say this is the way walk ye in it. Well, that didn't go quite as well as I wanted to at the end, but if you would take your notes and read those passages, I think it'll be a real encouragement for you to know that God wants to speak to you because you have been given his Holy Spirit. What an incredible truth the church has been given. Father, we're so thankful because the scriptures are so full and they have so many things to challenge us with. And Lord, I'm asking as we continue to study that we'll continue to learn and we'll be convinced that this is the way that we should walk. Lord, this is what we ask for as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your patience.